History is full of both triumph and tragedy, and perhaps nothing conveys that idea better than video footage of cultural icons. These moments captured on film are both poignant and eerie, giving viewers a surreal and personal look into the past. To build up a future, you have to know the past. Before the diary, before the secret annex, before the concentration camps, Anne Frank had a life much like any other 13-year-old girl's, including watching her neighbors get married. On July 22, 1941, she was captured on film leaning out the window of her family's apartment at Merveda Plain 37 in Amsterdam to watch her neighbor's wedding party pass by. Less than a year later, Frank would go into hiding in the secret annex of her father's business, where she and her family would remain for two years. More than a decade later, after Frank's diary had become famous, the neighbors recognized her in the video and shared it with her father. Later still, they shared it with the Anne Frank House Museum. It's the only known film footage of Frank. Less than four years later, Frank died at Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Frank's legacy and the reminder of her fate lives on through her diary and the museum. As for her former apartment, seen in the video, according to the Anne Frank House, its purpose remains the same. The apartment provides accommodation to writers from abroad who cannot work in freedom in their own countries. Impressionist painter Pierre-Auguste Renoir grew up in Paris and found his early inspiration there, but he went more and more frequently to the south of France as he grew older. The area provided both artistic inspiration and the warm weather he needed, because beginning in 1894, Renoir developed rheumatoid arthritis. His movement became extremely limited over the next 20 years. He lost the ability to walk or to hold a paintbrush without tying it to himself. In 1915, Renoir was filmed by his young friend Sacha Gatry, who later became an actor and director. The clip of Renoir was part of Gatry's longer project, Sud de Chez Nous, or Those of Our Land, which also included film footage of other French artists, including Claude Monet, French writers including Antole France, and French actors including Sarah Bernhardt. Gatry made it to showcase arts and culture in France in response to a German proclamation about the superiority of their own culture. In the film, Renoir can be seen painting at home, his gnarled hands holding his brush, talking to Gatry while smoking a cigarette. Though others have to light a cigarette for him and hand him his paintbrush, Renoir refuses to stop creating. Rosare Satia isn't a super well-known name in the United States, but she was the queen of Cambodia's rock and roll scene in the 1960s and 1970s. In the country's capital, Pinyon Pen, pop and rock thrived during the Vietnam War, with American influence filtering in, and during the reign of King Noradam Sianuk, who loved Western music. He dubbed Satia the golden voice of the royal capital, according to her sister in a documentary about the Cambodian music scene. Satya and other Cambodian rock stars covered Western rock songs, changing their meaning with new Khmer lyrics. Satya's biggest hits were usually tragic love songs, but with upbeat music and vocals. The good times came to an abrupt, violent end when Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge took control of Cambodia in 1975. Under this regime, any sign of creativity or intellectuality was destroyed. Most of Cambodia's rock stars died in the killing fields. As for Satya, she vanished, and there are varying stories about her ultimate fate, but she likely died too. Before all that, Satya was filmed undergoing military training and parachuting out of a plane for a feature in Khmer Republic magazine. Satya, chatting and smiling in the film, had no idea she might need those skills a few years later, when her country descended further into civil war. On April 3, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was in Memphis supporting black sanitation workers who were striking for higher wages, giving a speech at the Bishop Charles Mason Temple. The next day, he was assassinated. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a hotel balcony in Memphis. His April 3rd speech was eerily prophetic. He spoke of a previous assassination attempt against him in 1958. Later, he acknowledged that he might not live to old age, but said he'd made peace with the idea. He said, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. He assured his supporters that they would get there with or without him. On April 5th, the day after the assassination, outlets reported looting and arson in Memphis, as well as violence in Harlem and Brooklyn. Other black leaders, as well as President Lyndon B. Johnson, advocated for nonviolent responses in keeping with King's legacy. As King had predicted, the civil rights movement carried on without him. F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald embody the carefree fun of the Roaring Twenties, but their lives weren't as enchanted as they may have seen. In the mid-1920s, they partied along the French Riviera while Scott wrote The Great Gatsby, but their marriage was already crumbling. 
The documentary F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great American Dreamer, explains that, but also shows home video clips that present an idyllic life quite different from the apparent reality. They sit together outside, lapping and cuddling their baby daughter, Frances Scotty Fitzgerald. Scott writes away diligently at a table in the garden. There's no hint to the tragedies to come. In the 1930s, Scott struggled with alcoholism and Zelda with her mental health. He was in and out of jails and hospitals, and she was in and out of mental health care facilities. Within 20 years, they were both dead. Scott died in 1940 of a heart attack brought on by his long-term alcohol abuse. Sadly, Zelda died in a fire at Highland Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina in 1948. She was being treated for schizophrenia and was set to be released soon. A nurse admitted to setting the fire, though she was never charged. Watching the videos of the Fitzgeralds, those somber endings are hard to imagine. On the evening of May 6th, off the coast of Ireland, Lusitania enters the war zone, alone. May 7, 1915 was a turning point in World War I, but not because of any battle. It was the day a German U-boat sank the British passenger liner RMS Lusitania. More than 1,000 people died in the wreck, including 128 Americans. About a week before, the Lusitania left New York City for Liverpool on what would be its final voyage. The same day, the New York Tribune and the Washington Times both reported on warnings from the German embassy that Allied vessels might be susceptible to attack, so travel on them should be avoided. Despite the warning, the Lusitania was bustling with passenger activity. Filmed before leaving New York, footage courtesy of the National Archives shows passengers arriving at the dock and waving goodbye from the decks. They're blindly unaware of what will happen in less than a week. Important to note, as the ship pulls out to sea, the video clearly shows the lifeboats lined up on deck. Unfortunately, because the ship sank within 20 minutes after being hit, only six lifeboats were used. After the attack in the Lusitania, both the U.S. and the United Kingdom saw a rise in anti-German feelings. At that point, and for the next two years, German-American relations worsened. Later in 1915, under pressure from the Allies, Germany agreed to stop torpedoing non-military ships, but the truce didn't last. Two years later, Germany went back on their word and began submarine attacks on all ships. This was a major impetus for the U.S. eventually entering the war. 